it. Yes, potatoes are great. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another exciting episode of The Friendly Men. You know me as Ben. You've seen me here before. Mark's not here with us today, but James and I are going to be doing this interview with Monty Melnick, the tour manager of the month. We also have BA's return, the guy, sloppy seconds king himself, BA. The king of junk rock. And we also have joining us all the way from Canada, our good friend Yaya. So yes, yeah, so Monty, uh, B.A. has had some history with the Ramones. He went on tour with Marky. He wrote a song about you can't kill Joey Ramones. So this is very important to bring you guys together because also B.A. has read your book. On the Road with the Ramones, bonus edition. Which you can now buy on Amazon.com with the red sticker. Uh, the new edition with 40 additional pages right there. So uh, I'm just going to kick this over uh, to uh, B.A. First of all, it's really exciting for me to be able to ask some questions from Monty. I, I, I love the book. Bought it ages ago. I, I, I'll have to get the new edition then because if there's more material, I'm totally jazzed to read about it. In some other interviews, I've, everybody talks about how revolutionary their sound was. Uh, to me, what the Ramones did was prove this theory that uh, I subscribe to. I think the first time I heard it said was Captain Sensible, and he probably got it from somebody else. But if you strip away all the trappings, the overdubs, the uh, harmonies, synthesizers, and you're able to play a song either on a piano or an acoustic guitar, and you've still got a song, that's songwriting. If you can't do that, then it's a recording. Interesting, interesting. Well, you know, the Ramones shook down all that and then they got into a, like a very compact musical form, which, which, which when, when they traveled all over the world and in the United States, kids would see them and said, this is not that complicated. I mean, as long as you're playing good, comp, you know, good music and, and you know your instrument fairly well, you didn't have to be Eric Clapton on guitar or anything or drum solos. They, all these kids saw them and said, hey, they can do that. We can do that. And all these bands formed all over the place. I always kind of looked at the Ramones as like, this would have been a band of the boyfriends that the Shangri-Las used to sing about. <laughs> <laughs> they well, were the know. kind of outcast, reject guys on the street, you know. I mean, well, and I, I thought yeah. the idea that these guys would make a band out of that was just brilliant. Well, originally, I mean, punk goes way back, you know, to like... Uh, you know, biker, biker gangs and uh, James, you know, Marlon Brando and the sure. Wild Things and all, you know. But initially, they, they didn't like the name punk in, in, in the early years. I mean, there was nothing around that time. The Ramones came between glam rock was phasing out and then this new, uh, you can say punk music, a new way that was coming in. So they were, in the, they were in the transition phase there. They really didn't like to be called punk rock. I wanted to ask, um... Now, reading your book, it was very clear uh, a lot of the Ramones just weren't comfortable with that label. They didn't like it. Hell, they, they even resented it. But, like, at what point, while you were, uh, like, as a touring manager, you got to see the fans, you got to see the opening bands. At what point did that start to change? Well, the more they played, the more they played out, the bigger the bigger clubs they got into and the more audiences they got to uh... They appreciate the audience, basically. You know, they they, they understood that what, what the audience was about, the punk audiences and stuff like that. So they, they grew into it, basically. You know, Monty, you were talking about smaller clubs, and I, I can't help but think of the bands that came from CBGBs. Obviously, the Ramones are the most recognizable, but not not the only band to come from that uh, humble beginnings. Well, did you have to deal with Hilly Crystal at all in the, the yeah. people at CGGBs? Well, first of all, recognizable. Come on, God, not most. I mean, Talking Heads, uh, Patty Smith, uh, all the, you know, Blondie. Blondie. Got, recognizable. Yeah. Come on, you know. <laughs> well, I, I was. Yeah, the, they, were, they were on the top of the list there, but, but yes. there's a lot of groups came out of there. The funny thing about that is, like, well, all these groups I just mentioned but opened up for the Ramones in the beginning. And then later on, they became so much bigger than the Ramones later on, which kind of, you know, the, the Ramones would say, oh, wow, you know, they, these guys opened up for us early on. And now, now 
<laughs> you know, they're so they're humongous. We can't even get on the radio and stuff like that. You know, you no, know, of course I dealt with Hilly. I mean, <laughs> you had to. Uh, he, you know, he is like a curmudgeon. He had his, his, you know, his original uh, saying was, "I don't like these guys, but I'll bring them back." You know, stuff like that. You know, the beautiful part about CBGBs was, you know, back those days, you know, seventies. Well, most clubs in New York or around the country, etc., they they just wanted top forty music. You know, they didn't want to have a band come in and play original music. But Hilly realized that you know, you know, bring some people in, they'll drink at the bar, what the hell, and play your stuff. They let all these bands come in and play original stuff. That was very unusual, and that's the beautiful part about CBGBs and Hilly. What he did, man. you know, I dealt with him, sure. In fact, we didn't trust them. We always used to have someone on the door counting for ourselves with a clicker. We didn't trust them. While you're experiencing this in real time, did you know you were part of something this special? No. This could be a special thing. Maybe like years later, the people say, wow, look at this. You guys don't know what's going on. You know, you're, just, you're doing it. You know, you're, you're there. I was working. I've actually got a funny story because... Uh... When we were out doing the tour with uh, Marky, this was probably like two years after the Ramones had split. He was out doing a bin with the Intruders, right? The morning after a show, we were staying at a motel, same one they were, right next door to Cracker Barrel. And we got up in the morning to go to the Cracker Barrel. And we walked in and they were all sitting at the table. And uh, Mark said, oh, B.A., did you know about this? And I was like, we just came in here to eat, and he said, yeah, sit down. And uh, when it came time to pay the check, he said, no, 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 this is all covered. <laughs> I'm like, really? What? He said, oh, the Cracker Barrel ownership is our big fans. So years later, when I read in the book that uh, you guys used to swap T-shirts and stuff for a meal at Cracker Barrel, I'd hit home. I was like, that's where it all came from. <laughs> yeah, basically, it was a, a, a photograph. You know, one, one day we walked in the Cracker Barrel, Get on the road, you, you need some good places to eat. And that was okay, good food, and it was around. And uh, one of the managers came over and he said, hey, you got a, a photo signed? Would they sign the photo? And then at the end of the meal, they said, it's on us. <laughs> so we went to another Cracker Barrel and went to the manager and said, hey, look, there's a Ramones, here's a picture. And they said, fine. So they paid for it. So, Absolutely. And, and so Johnny said, go out and get the map of all the Cracker Barrels. And then we said, <laughs> <laughs> And we stopped as many Genius. as we could, because why not? You know, they fed the whole day. It was amazing. We, we were talking before you came on about the fact that you had said that it was difficult for uh, the Ramones to make waves into the Midwest initially. And I said, well, it wasn't just the Ramones. It was like everybody had trouble penetrating the market in the Midwest because it was so dominated by FM radio and all the arena rock bands. What, what was that club? The Vogue, was it? What, uh, in Vogue Theater, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, that 78 Ramones gig here is historic. It really kicked the whole punk scene into action here, which I guess is probably the case in a lot of markets around the country. Yeah, that's what happened. You know, Gradually, each city got the, a place where bands like the Ramones could play, and that it opened up the market, you know. You know, I think the legacy of the Ramones, they were kind of like Johnny Appleseeds. You know, Johnny Appleseed would plant apples all over the place. The Ramones would go to all these small cities and play these little dinky clubs. And kids would see that and, uh, and, and scenes would happen. Tommy leaves the band. Is that when you and Johnny take over as far as doing like day-to-day -day operations? Well, not take over. I mean, John, Johnny was always into like things. So. The, the logistics of the band, basically. But I mean, Tommy came in basically as he just wanted to manage them and produce them. He didn't want to be in the band in the early years, you know. When Tommy, touring was too much for him. He just couldn't take it. You know? He just wanted to produce and manage and stuff like that. So uh, when he decided to leave, he's going to stuck around and manage and uh, produce the stuff that Ramones, which is great. He loved that. It's just touring was too much for him, basically. And, and then Johnny would, took over more of a things that Tommy was doing. I mean, Tommy initially in the early years was doing writing like uh, publicity texts for opening shows and stuff like that. And, and Johnny, Johnny said, he's, he's like the general basically. You ran the board when they played CBGBs? Yes, yeah. Wow. The, the, the first tours in 1977 uh, with the Talking Heads, I was doing sound that, well, I did everything. The problem was yeah. 
when, when they started getting jobs at CBGBs and I was working over there and then the, the place that were at the Pokemon Studios had to close down, the neighbors that shut us down or something. Oh, but geez. at that time, the remote started getting jobs, you know? Mm. So I jumped over there and started doing everything for them basically in the beginning, you know, pulling the equipment, driving and doing the sound and figure different clubs, small clubs around the area, tri-state area in Boston and all that stuff like that. That's why I, where I started kind of learning the, uh, from the bottom up, the business of road managing basically. You know, a lot of people think touring is like a lot of fun. You know? No, it's like it's a lot a of job. times it's like day, next day, you back in the bed and show the next day, and the next day. Is, so, you, you know, get to see the cities. Luckily, with the Ramones, sometimes we'd play a couple of, you know, a couple of days in the city. Then we'd have a day, to, you know, the next day you could kind of look around the city. Reading your book, I, I got this feeling that the Ramones was like an institution. Everyone was putting in a lot of work and effort to keep going. Uh, like less of, a, less of a band than more of an institution. What do you mean by an institution? You hear about how the band members didn't exactly get along and it was the crew, it was yourself, it was Johnny that was kind of holding things together to make this music and to go on tour and, and, and all of that. that. That's my impression of it. In the early years, they were friends. They grew up in Forest Hills. They got their band together. They were friends, you know. Just later on with the... With the, the, the girlfriends and all that Linda stuff that uh, it, it, it was a split basically that they what they did there was they, they didn't want to socialize after the shows and stuff like that they realized that what they had together the music they were producing was far more important than, than breaking up and fighting and stuff like that you know the, I, uh, I read a quote from Johnny one time it was one of the greatest quotes of all time he said I know my job is better than most, but I still resent it. You know? I, I just thought, what a great attitude that is. It's like, you know, well, he realized I, it was a business. You're saying that some days it was just like going to a job and you don't necessarily want to see the person you work with, but, you know, it's it's your job. So yeah, that's what he did look at it as a job. Also, the, the, another thing that was, the, you know, Joey had the OCD thing, which is very difficult. Yeah. I really appreciate you including those sections in the book because I have OCD too and uh, I, I really identified a lot with Joey and it was really nice to read both stories uh, and so thank you you were treating him in a very humane way and I somebody with OCD I really appreciate that <laughs> now that's the problem with Johnny he thought I was like favoring him but you know I wasn't I was just basically you know trying to help the guy and he needed it and uh, also myself too because as I said on the road, if they forgot something, I would have to go get it. What was Dee Dee like during all this? Because Dee Dee just seems like he was just this relaxed dude who just loved to party. Relax. Like, was... <laughs> <laughs> there was different. There was like eight different Dee Dees. There was not one Dee Dee, basically. There's a good Dee Dee, there was a bad Dee Dee, there's a drug addict Dee Dee, there was an alcoholic Dee Dee, there was a great songwriter. I mean, he would do he would do things like small, limited, like he would. Wouldn't take one drink, he'd drink the whole bottle. Wouldn't smoke a joint, he'd smoke the whole bag of pot. He wouldn't write one song, he'd write 10 songs in a row. It was difficult with him on the road. I mean, he OD'd a few times. And, uh, it was rough, you know, on and off with his, um, you know, in and out of rehabs and stuff like that. But then again, it was brilliant, you know. And then don't forget the greatest rap artist of all time, D.D. <laughs> King, came from that. That, that was interesting because they, you know, all of a sudden he said, oh, I like rap and I want to, they said, okay, look, do your, like, do your little album, you know, get it out of your system. He did his stuff, but it, it took off on his brain, you know, and he would uh, show up at gigs in a jumpsuit and gold chains and John was saying, what are you doing? You know, this is not the Ramones. You can't do that. But then at the end, he was like, you know, drifting off. He really wanted to, wasn't wasn't there and it was a shame you know this was the last few shows he was just, he wanted to be out he, as he says he wants he wanted to be out of the ramones army you know? he, he decided to leave everybody said oh it's the end uh, but johnny said no let's get a bass player so they were uh, auditioned about 20 different bass players the funny thing about it is ct was the first one they auditioned you know and johnny saw something in him at the time and uh it was great it was like having a young Didi. yeah and uh, they had to kind of suck in their stomachs and keep up with them. And, and he, he brought it back a lot of years to the band. It was great. I love yeah, they were just razor sharp on that uh, Escape from New York tour. I couldn't believe it. It harkened back, I thought, to how tight they were, you know, 
New Year's Eve 77, you know, which I consider probably the greatest live album of all time. <laughs> and, and the good thing about that is that Speedy kept on writing songs for that. Yeah, that's right. So they had the young, you know, young CJ there with, in the band and then Dee Dee's songs and stuff. So Experienced songwriter, yeah. It worked out better than they thought it would, would you know. Johnny saw it. He said, oh, you know, let's just get another bass player. CJ, Maybe. CJ's great. I love CJ. Lava Blues in 96. Is there any great stories you could share with us? Well, the thing about that is like, um, you know, Metallica is on headlining sound. Guardian, Rancid, then their bones. I put the band on stage and I'm standing on the side and all of a sudden the Metallic is there, Soundgarden's there. They're all big, huge fans. The Ramones, they loved the Ramones. They, they, they said they were kids and saw the Ramones. As, as a matter of fact, I remember somewhere in Ohio, these kids come back, they say, hey, look, we're Metallica, we love you guys. You know, they were little kids, you know. <laughs> now they're dealing with huge thing, act, Lollapalooza and Ramones are opening up, but, but they were there. On the side of the stage watching the Ramones. They were having they got very close, you know. Johnny got very friendly with the whole band, they got friendly with the Metallic and Soundgarden Rancid at the time, you know. With a lot of resurgence of all these old punk bands like Black Flag, you got Danzig joining back the Misfits. Do you think if the Ramones were still around today, could they sell out the garden like now the Misfits did? I think so. Yeah. Hey, they sold out down in South America. The stadium there, fifty thousand people. That, that's a thing. I mean, uh, they're so much bigger now than they were when they were around. You know, I'll it's tell insane. this. I'll tell this crazy joke. I tell too many times that the Ramones were this big. When I was working for them, I worked on a big raise. You know, <laughs> <laughs> what what I feel happened basically is all the kids that were listening to the Ramones over those years finally got into positions where they were going to put them in soundtracks and movie and exactly. commercials, and they did. They finally got in. To, when they, they were around, a bunch of the four originals are passed away to see all this commercials and movie soundtracks and getting on the radio now. What a shame they, they couldn't be around. Yeah, for that. people that had grown up being shit on basically for being Ramones fans finally came into positions of power in the media. Yeah, it, it's really unfortunate. I mean, it it's gratifying in a way to see that their legacy carries on but it, it's it's really a shame that they never got to capitalize on that when they were around let's see it yeah see how big they are now it's a shame yeah. going back to the south america thing that they didn't realize how big they were down there so that was an early sh on that scene with the with the crazy fans we didn't realize there was like hundreds of kids outside all of a sudden and uh, i had like four security guards with me at that time but the street came out and made a right into one way you know from that way and we had to go to the right. So I sent some security guards out there to try to clear it out. They tried to clear it out, so we pulled out. And then some of the kids blocked us with a, the with a car. So we're stuck in the street. <laughs> and there's like, we had, I had security guards, but it was a little painful for me. Johnny's yelling, good job, Monty. Good. Like, <laughs> That's gotta be I, mind blowing. I mean, but, I hadn't seen anything like that since the old Beatlemania. It, it was scary. It was, it, in fact, we got kicked out of several hotels every time we went down and we had to find a hotel that had a big fence around it, you know, to keep the kids away. They got a taste of what it was really like to be a, a, a mega group there, you know. Well, jo the band, Johnny didn't like it because he couldn't go out. He'd like to go out and go to stores and stuff. And then in restaurants, we'd have to clear the restaurants out to make sure nobody was in the restaurant, stuff like that. I didn't mind. I could go out and walk around. They didn't know me, so whatever. But Johnny hated it because he couldn't go out and do things, you know. In the Ramones Raw video, one of my favorite footage is Dee Dee and Marky waking you up to get an American Express card because Dee Dee wanted a Rolex. Did Dee Dee do a lot of shopping on the road, like yeah, buying yeah. ridiculous stuff? Like he would, he was into watches. He liked his watches stuff, and also like switchblades and knives and stuff like that. He buy a lot of those and try to get it back into the states. But those days, they he smuggled them in with the um, drum hardware. Now, Marky was the goofy one, though. He was the one that always made everybody laugh by doing the crazy thing. Yeah, he's goofy. He was goofy. He was fun with it. He would do yeah. crazy, idiotic things sometimes, like bug eating and stuff. He bet, <laughs> they bet him, hey, there's a roach over there. We'll give you 50 bucks. Eat it. He'd, he'd eat it, you know. <laughs> Wait, I, are you, hold on. Monty, he really ate a cockroach? Yeah. For 50 yeah. bucks? Yeah, a couple of times. But then one time we're like in Hawaii, you know, and then there's a spider crawling around. And they, they, the fans said, go ahead, eat. I said, 
don't touch that damn thing and kill yourself. It could be a poisonous spider. Try to stop them, you know? How do you handle all these crazy artists? How do you deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis? <laughs> That's part of the job of Tour Manager Old Manager. Not only do you deal with crazy artists, but the, the, the crazy crews, too. So it's double the <laughs> amount of nutty people around you on the road. Good. You have to handle it. That's part of the yeah. job of tour manager, road manager. You got to be diplomatic. Uh, another thing, basically, they, you know, practical jokes, so they take it out on me, basically. Instead of, because if they did it to themselves, they would like, you know, fight. So they figured, do it to me. So, well, all right, that's part of the job. It, do, it's stupid little high school pranks, you know, put honey on my briefcase or the door of the handle of the van or something. And it's <laughs> idiotic. It's better me than, than doing it to each other than fighting or something. Did you go to Danny Fields about a lot of advice? Just no, about I, your own. how I got hired basically one time, Danny, uh, I think we were in Ohio or something. And he was, they didn't have a lot of people to show. So he was afraid he wasn't going to get paid or something. So he said, Monty, go back and get the money. If you can get the money, you could be the road manager. So I, I got the money and it elevated me up to road manager at the time. And then you got honey on your briefcase. Well, that was later on. Really. <laughs> <laughs> what? is impressive to me is um it's got to be really i don't know I, humbling when you think back about you know you're talking about having the bands play at performance studios or or you know the shows at cbgb where you'd just be playing for the other bands and now people look at those moments in your life as being a watershed event you know that uh, that really shaped a lot of what became important in music for like the next 40 years. You know, that, that's that gotta be a pretty amazing feeling to know that you've been part of that. Well, I'm happy that I'm happy I was part of it, yeah. I mean, yeah. You, look, you look back and you don't realize what's going on, you know. But uh, over the years now, people say, Stones, Beatles, Ramones in the same sentence. I mean, that, yeah. that, that floors me and how big they are now. The legacy of how influential they were over yeah. the years. Uh, for all these bands that's you know like bono writing you two wrote that song the miracle of joe ramon for god's sakes you too <laughs> he talked to us about the process in writing on the road with the ramones like how did you how did you build that book well initially people came to me and said you know you gotta do a book blah 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 i said i really didn't feel comfortable with joey around you waited yeah till till till, the, till his passing yeah but you know i had to talk about the ocd and it's you know things he was doing did you keep diaries while you were on the road and, yeah, and just kind of go back to them well yeah luckily i i had calendars and stuff the things we were doing and, and luckily i put a lot of stuff away in a room uh you know passes and itineraries and posters luckily i didn't throw that stuff out i was almost going to throw it out one of my girlfriends shared said don't throw it out because the early years nobody knew how big they were joey had done uh, his solo albums on sanctuary records and at the time, I was ready to do something. Uh, a good friend of mine, Kevin Patrick, was friends with the uh, guy at the Sanctuary. He said they, they have a publishing house there. So I came in and, and they, I said, look, I'm not really a writer. They said, don't worry, we'll get you a ghostwriter. A, a number of different people came around. And finally, this guy, Frank Meyer, terrific guy. I don't know if you know Frank Meyer, street walking cheetahs. And he's in L.A. and plays with uh, Eddie Spaghetti and really great musician. And one is a writer for like a, a number of different articles and different papers and stuff. And he was a huge Ramones fan, so he, I got hooked up with him. He did such a great job. I gave him co-writing on the book. What a wonderful person to deal with. And uh, luckily, I had all this stuff in the house. So we went, took about a year to go through all these different things we wanted to put in the book. The good thing about the book is that they let the publisher let me put in a lot of images, uh, photos, posters, tour passes, itineraries. You know, usually the book is like some text, 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 pictures in the middle, text, text, text. My book's like just full of four, 300 pictures and images and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, that's great. Which I was very lucky to do at the time. You know? It was very colorful. I had a great art director. You know, behind the page, the text is like the images like barbed wire and think, colors and stuff like that. So I was very lucky with that. Yeah, so how did you uh, decide on the format of the book? Uh, I actually like, uh, I, I see this sort of format around a lot with like books specifically about like musicians and scenes. So how did you uh, settle on that? Where it's like blurbs, Johnny said this. Well, a Johnny lot of the, there's a lot of the oral history too. So we interviewed a lot of people, and I took interviews from other people, and put it in a book. So it's not just me. It's a it's a band and other people talking. 
oral history type of thing. Like, please kill me is an oral history type of thing. Yeah. And, uh, and Frank was a great writer with me. And I was tell him some stories and he would write stuff. And, and, and the good thing about it is all the pictures. So for the punk rock audiences, uh, they didn't have to read it. Just look at the pictures, you know, basically. It was good for them. <laughs> yeah. So would you follow it up with a more straight autobiography? Would, would I? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Doing this book uh, was pretty intense for me. When you say intense, did it did it kind of scrape up some emotional? Like like, yeah. how did you feel? It was a catharsis for me, you know. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had to go back and relive and tell about things that happened over twenty years. The the impact of what you did with those guys is globally huge and they grow exponentially all the time so i would imagine that that be, you're really kind of giving us the historical record of something that's going to be larger than us i was there from the beginning to the end if Arturo, yeah it sounds like it if arturo is still around for arturo great terrific person wonderful art director and lighting director and did the logo and all that if he was still alive there's me and him now it's just me i'm the only one that was there i probably read half a dozen uh, Ramon's biographies and this was by far the most enjoyable. I thought that um, Hey Ho, Let's Go book was just kind of dark and very clinical. The Ramon's American Band was good, you know, but it was obviously a very authorized biography by the band when it was released. So it was just strictly, you know, whatever they wanted the public to hear. I, I think Monty, your book is just fascinating with all Thank the you behind the scenes stories and you know it's told from a place of love i think that's probably the the best thing about it is just i think it shows you were along for the ride on an amazing experience that turned out to be a lot more significant in the long run than you could have ever imagined well also what i try to put in the book is a lot of things behind the scenes uh yeah you know people go to a show and they see the band up there they don't realize underneath there's a foundation underneath the band. There's a crew too, you know? If the, there's the lousy sound, man, the band's not gonna sound good. If the guitar tech's bad, the guitar's gonna be out of tune, et cetera. So I try to put in all the experience I had being tour, road manager, tour manager, and bring in what's like other things into the into my book. You know, I show the, the uh, stage plots and stuff like that. I talk about the crew and I interview the crew too. So. I taught, try to bring in what the foundation underneath the band too. Seeing that legacy of simplicity uh, really enter music, uh, thanks to the Ramones, uh, and just the influence that had. You must be proud of that, like being a part of the movement that taught people that simplicity can be just as good as like a virtual. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm very happy. I'm very happy that I was involved in, with the band. And, uh, it's a lot of years under my belt there, so it's a lot of years of hard work and it's you know, just what I, I'm upset about is that the original four aren't here to see it. That is a shame. Yeah, it I is mean, a there's, shame. There's still some, you know, Marky's out there playing and CJ plays and Richie's out there playing. Yeah. Still have Elvis out there um, with yeah. uh, <laughs> Elvis Glenn Burke. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but the what upsets me is the original four are not around to really see how, what they did, what, what, what they created. Yeah. But I'm happy, I'm happy. Well, Monty, I'm I glad. thank you a lot for joining us. This has been exciting. Ben and I grew up watching your videos, Ramones Raw, End of the Century, and I always found this incredibly interesting. So, Monty, you have been uh, such a delight. I, I just, I just want to thank you guys for allowing me to be part of the panel. I think I said initially, you know, I don't think I have anything to contribute at the level that Monty and the Ramones did, you know, but I did want to say I really enjoyed uh, this uh, conversation. I, like I said, I, I think your book and your memories stand out because, you know, they're told from experience and from a place of love, you know, so I think that, uh, that puts a unique stamp on it and um, I can never overestimate the influence that you've had on the music that I love. So thank you very much. Take take that for what it's worth and uh, thank you very much for letting me be part of this. I have to agree with BA. You guys have been incredibly inspirational and I and I thank you for all the work 
you did with those guys and, and, and keeping things functional. And thank you for talking about the book and thank you for being very candid with us. Yeah, right. I'll have to get a new copy of the book. No, no, no. Joe and Joe.